My free history. Imagine yourself being a Habsburg soldier in the 16th century, waiting on the attack of an Ottoman army facing you. Suddenly, through the mist, figures appear. Your heart stops. If they are Janissaries, you might have to fight them, or run away depending on your preferences. In this video, you will learn how to decide if your opponent is dangerous. Therefore, we will look at the appearance of the Janissaries. Since the Janissaries were soldiers, our modern mindset would expect them to wear uniforms. This would enable us to easily recognize them. It seems you are lucky since Goodwin talks about this point while referring to conquests at the end of the 15th century. In these territories, many people would have sought employment in a standing army such as existed nowhere else. Moreover, the army wore distinguishing uniforms, a discipline that was not imposed in Europe until Martinet equipped the French army in the 18th century. Actually, it turns out that the Ottomans were the first to use uniforms at all. In the standards of the six regiments of Sipahis and in the caps of the Janissaries, we see the first inchoate ideas of military uniform, which were afterwards adapted with such success in the European standing armies. Of course the Janissaries were embedded in Ottoman culture and therefore they dressed accordingly. Bertrand de la Procure, a Burgundian squire, describes the Ottoman appearance in the early 15th century. They wear two or three thin, ankle-length cotton ropes, one over the other. For a coat they wear a felt rope called cabinate. It is light and very waterproof. This description proves valuable, since according to Nicole, the Ottoman costume was based on Persian fashion and stayed nearly the same from the 15th century to the early 19th century. Hubbard, in his book written in 1920, is a little bit more specific on the appearance of the Janissaries. The Janissaries uniform was of dark blue cloth, plainly cut and comparatively free from ornamentation. We can confirm the color of the trousers through Nicole. In the mid-15th century, ordinary Janissaries received a relatively small amount of money, but they also got enough blue cloth for a pair of trousers, a large amount of linen, a new woolen coat, a new shirt and enough money to buy both arrows and clean collars. And we get a little bit more details on the collars from Tyrell. He refers to a report by Baron de Tot, a Hungarian-born officer and diplomat in French service, who describes the Janissaries uniform in more detail. The proper regulation dress of the Janissaries was a long and loose blue coat, a doll man or vest underneath it, a stripped girl or cummerbund, or silk or linen, with fringed ends, white blue trousers and red leather shoes. Sultan Mustafa II took the field against the Germans in 1695. He took 3000 Bostanches with him, whom he formed into three battalions, the first dressed in red coats and blue trousers, the second in blue coats and red trousers, the third in green coats and blue trousers. Goodwin confirms this. The ranks of the 4000 Bustanchis were filled by the Archemi Oaklands, including, in some instances, boys straight from the levee. They wore blue pantaloons and a red jacket, which was to be the uniform of Salon III's new army at the end of the 18th century, while the red conical cap sometimes ended in a warped flap. Concerning the material of the clothes, Nicole has information. The Janissaries uniform was largely made of wool. Of course, officers added some extravagant furs. Naturally, officers could not just look like ordinary soldiers. Isn't that obvious? Tyrell adds to this. The officers wore tall cylindrical white turbans with a flat top. In the field, the uniform was conspicuous by its absence. So the officers did not even care about their uniforms and probably had them made for themselves according to their own wishes. There were other accessories than the uniform which showed the rank. Metal badges and medallions were also worn to distinguish ranks and grades and the strip of facing cloth sewn on the coat was a distinctive mark of every Janissary and was always cut off when its wearer was degraded or expelled from the corps. Actually, it is not entirely clear if only officers disregarded the uniform regulations. Tyrell cast a shadow of doubt on the Janissaries' uniforms at all. But the cloth issued to them being insufficient, only the trousers were made from it, 
and they wore coats of any color according to Baron de Todd. They only put on their caps and their uniform trousers and red shoes on occasions of state parade or ceremony, at other times wearing turbans of coarse white linen twisted on their heads like those of the French Suave. I have to note here that Baron de Todd trained the Ottoman military around 1770, when the Janissaries already were in a steep decline. I would not take the typical situation around this time as an example for every era of the Ottoman Empire. Aside from the clothes, I should mention another factor in the Janissaries' appearance. Moreover, they were forbidden to be wasteful, to drink alcohol, to gamble or, as a simple soldier, to grow a full beard, to pursue trade or commerce and marry before leaving the corps. The important part here is about the beard. It seems the ban on full beards was a religious rule for slaves. Only officers and other high-ranking Janissaries were allowed to grow full beards, although technically they still were cools of the Sultan. All of these descriptions result in the following picture. The Janissaries usually wore a moustache, blue trousers and a coat that should have been blue, although in reality could have any color available. What an impressive appearance! After discussing the clothes extensively, let us turn to a specific part of the Janissaries' equipment, the shoes. But did they even have any? Since we are talking about equipment hundreds of years ago, this is a fair question. The officers wore high boots, the men generally went barefoot on a campaign. Again, Tyrrell is talking about a time when there were much too many Janissaries. They were an enormous strain on the budget. Maybe in earlier times their equipment was better like other sources describe. In the example from 1730, the army market was composed of 85 separate tents. The most represented craft whose members occupied 8 tents with a working capital of 129,600 akches were the bootmakers. The most heavily invested group was the grocers, who occupied 4 tents with a working capital of 1.4 million akches. So at least bootmaker was a common occupation in the Janissary strain. We have already heard that at least at parades the Janissaries wore red shoes. But actually, on campaign, boots would be much more useful. Nicole supports this. They wear knee-high boots and white breeches, into which they stuff all the ropes so that they will not get in the way when they are fighting or traveling or busy. So, we can add the footwear to the picture we already generated for our Janissary. Either they wore red shoes on parade or when being on campaign, in the best case, they had boots. This picture is getting better and better. Now we will move from the bottom of a Janissary to the top. There they wore a very special item. We heard about conical hats and some sources talk about turbans, but the most prestigious hat cover was the burk. The headdress was a white cap in Turkish Akberg, and there is no doubt that it is the headdress later worn by the Janissaries, which Latin writers call Mitra or Peleus. It was a conical cap of white felt, stiff enough to stand up a few inches above the crown of the head, but so long that the upper part then bent back and fell down behind over the nape of the neck. We have already talked about this white cap in the very first video on this channel. The caps probably originated in the first experiments with slave troops. While the regular troops wore red hats, the slaves received white ones. As a gesture to his new troops, the Sultan put his cap on too. So the burk is a symbol for the connection to the Sultan. Not only inside their heads, but also on the outside, the Janissary showed the obsession with soup, which we talked about in the video about the organization and the ranks. The wooden spoon with which the Janissaries ate the soup was worn by them stuck into the copper plum case which decorated the front of the white felt caps. These felt caps were of different shapes to distinguish the different ranks. The spoons were not meant to be weapons, although they might be useful in self-defense against fresh fruit or a vicious bowl of soup. Therefore, only one, although very important accessoire, can be added to our picture. Now we will investigate everything we just heard about in pictures. Luckily, the relevant paintings, prints, miniatures and photos are too old to have copyright anymore. Palma describes one of the most prominent pictures of a Janissary as follows. 
Its form is beautifully recorded for us in Gentile Bellini's drawing of a Janissary made in 1480, now in the British Museum. So let us take Palma by his word. This print is probably one of the oldest reliable pictures of a Janissary. A prominent part of the Janissary's clothing is the head, the burg. In this example it is extremely tall. Probably the Janissary painted here put on his best clothes for the occasion. Unfortunately, in this picture we do not see the spoon, which should be fixed on the front of the head. I would like to draw your attention to the bow, the quiver and the small pit we see of the sabre, since we spent a whole episode talking about them. Take a moment to appreciate this print. It is really well done. And there also is this little guy, whom most of you will know. Of course, Master Fakemal Pasha never was a real Janissary, but this is probably the best known picture of someone posing as one of these elite soldiers from earlier times. What I want to point out here is the Kammerband. In most other pictures you don't see it very well. In addition, I think his shoes are red, like in the descriptions of the parade uniforms, but since this picture is colorized I'm not sure about this. The color could be brown as well. And of course, there's the burg. The form seems relatively accurate, but the emblem on the front looks like its creator put a lot of fantasy in it. The next picture is a miniature. Here we see a group of Janissaries. Some of them wear red shoes and blue coats like in the descriptions in the literature, but this does not seem to be the standard. When looking at the trousers, only one soldier has blue ones. Please also take a moment to look at the feathers on top of the heads. The length is amazing. This is a painting of the Aga of the Janissaries. His headwear looks a little bit different to those we have seen before. Maybe it is a turban and not a burg. You also see a very small cummerbund, but I think altogether this picture does not tell us very much about the uniform of the ordinary soldiers. It is just a good painting. I selected the next picture, which again shows the Aga as well as the Janissary, because it gives a nice example of different burgs. When taking the size into account, the Janissary could probably be a cadet. The size of the hats makes it obvious who holds the higher rank. In addition, we see the so-called spoon nest on the front of the hat, the metal piece on which the spoon could be placed. In my humble opinion, the burg makes the Janissaries look like nuns and not like very dangerous soldiers. And finally, there are the pictures I drew in order to symbolize a Janissary. Do you notice any difference? in quality compared to the ones before? Surely you don't. I would like to add a point here. We should look at all the pictures and descriptions with a critical mind. We rely on reports of people like ambassadors. Of course, only the prettiest soldiers were presented to these officials. The ragtag troops were probably kept out of sight. The same thing holds for the painters. They were either paid by some Ottoman official or an artist like Gentile Benini through a guy who took some time to pose for the artist and put on the best clothes he could get for this occasion. So please be careful. And this probably is a good place to take a look at what we learned today. We got an overview of a Janissary's appearance. Usually they should wear blue trousers and coats but in practice a lack of fitting cloth prevented this. Therefore, the colors were more of a mixture and officers would do whatever they wanted anyway. The same held for shoes. On parades they should be red. On campaign the Janissaries probably preferred boots. That is, if they got any, and at least some of them would be lucky since the train included a lot of bootmakers. I started this episode by outlining how important it is to recognize a Janissary and therefore we should know their appearance. Well, the uniforms will turn out to pose an even greater danger to the Janissaries themselves. And now it is your turn again. Do you have better copyright free pictures of Janissaries? So long, we'll meet again in two weeks. Stay critical, stay curious, stay free 